everybody. Packed um, House, which is brilliant. So for those of you that don't know, uh, my name is Mick Yates, and I'm the chair of uh, Photo Froom. It's the first time we've done a photo festival in Froom, uh, but it's not the last. In fact, um, I've just been going through the dates for next year with Brooklyn, and so we've already got three or four other venues organised. Um, when we started, we thought we might have a couple of venues and maybe, I don't know, a dozen, two dozen photographers. We ended up with seven venues, 75 photographers, talks, workshops, portfolio reviews, pretty much the whole nine yards for a you know, photo festival. And uh, I'm not ready yet to say how many people came, but I am ready to say it's about twice what we expected in terms of the audience for the, for the whole show, the whole series of shows and so on. Um, so the job here is to do a couple of things. First, could you make sure your mobile is on silent? Because we are recording this. We've had a few people ask us to record some of these talks. Uh, we recorded last night about Alex Seeley, and we're recording tonight. So the subject at hand, if I can find my click up, is, as it says up here, does photography mean anything? And this is kind of what we're facing. Let's look at these numbers. Um, this is a long time ago, about 2014. <coughs> 675 billion images in a year. So if you put it another way, in two minutes, we were uploading as many images as in the first 150 years of photography. Right? And how many of those are just stuck on a hard drive somewhere or disappeared off on the cloud or never been seen again? And when you're a photographer trying to make sense of all that, you're trying to figure out your place in the universe, basically. And of course, this, this is old data. Frankly, people have given up trying to figure it out. It's just an awful lot of photographs. So as we were putting this whole program together, this was the obvious last talk of the festival. What does photography mean? As we've asked about three, three, months, three weeks, sorry, putting photography shows and talks on. What does it all mean? And I was very lucky because I came across these two guys. Uh, one is a commercial photographer. That's... <laughs> you, see, you see what this is going to be? <laughs> They've started already. You're doing it to me. And the other one is a fine art photographer. Or is it the other way around? I'm not sure. Anyway, this is Joss. We might find out. Yeah. We might find out. This is Joss and this is Martin. And they found themselves in a happy position of becoming neighbours in Fru not too long ago. And as they've been telling me, and as I've been getting involved myself, they've been debating what they're doing as photographers, what it means, where it's going, what's going on from the different perspectives, uh, in the kitchen and over the bar, and now it's time to do it in public. So the only thing we know for sure about tonight is where it starts. We have absolutely no, no idea where it finishes. So what we're going to do is we're going to have Martin first, are you the fine art photographer or the commercial one? Both aren't, yeah. Yeah, yeah. one or the other. Yeah. Martin first, and then Joss. And then we're going to do a little <coughs> conversation on the stage. It's quite warm, so we're then going to break, get people a chance to you know, get a drink, and cool down a little bit, for a very short break. Then we'll come back and have a the whole audience. So that's the plan. So with that, did I cover it all, guys? <laughs> I still don't know which is which. <laughs> Hello everyone, I feel like I've been um, slightly missold this gig because I thought I was going to have the, the Madonna style mic and I could have some fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, not my book. I want to do a little bit of strutting and stuff. No, no I, I should say by the way before we go, like, this is the first festival I've ever curated and in dealing with these photographers I have developed what I call the diva list. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a scale of one to ten. <coughs> and it, as the festival hasn't finished, neither has the diva list. <laughs> Hashtag just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. Um, first, enormous thanks, I suppose, still, to Mick and his team for, um, for conceiving, gestating, and giving birth to this wonderful baby that is through the photo. I think there'll be a lot of mewling puking along the way, but I think we will see a uh, fully developed, amazing um, creature at the end of it. So that's fantastic. What an achievement. And I'm really chuffed. 
And the Oscar film we know it's great, we've got to put those ones together. I'm really going to say that to have Joss alongside me. Because um, I've known him barely a year and he has uh, just been such an amazing, generous, honest, warm person to know. So I know a few of your gifts now. And a consummate professional who I've been allowed to help as well. So I have been on two shoots with him. And that's been very interesting. Very interesting. And he likes my work, he says, and I like his. So this has obviously created a very interesting um, things to talk about all the time. But there's one thing that really pisses him off, is me going, yeah, but I'm just an amateur, I just, you know, it's a bit of fun of it. I don't earn any money. So, and I think it annoys me too other people. Anyway, things could have changed. So, my name is Martin Wade. I'm a fine art photographer. And I know that sounds a little bit like AA, and I don't want to, know, I know that's possibly trivialising addiction, but it does feel like that a little bit. Uh, photography for me has been uh, an addiction, but something that has followed me throughout life. My path through life has been wobbly. Uh, came from a background, same as my brother, where you probably had expectations. University, good job, art was definitely not one of the things you would do. So uh, I did maths, physics, chemistry at A-level, failed dismally. <laughs> I retook them, failed dismally. <laughs> Nearly joined the army, dodged a bullet. That not me, the army dodged a bullet because I don't <laughs> think they would have really liked it that much. And then ended up doing industrial chemistry as a, a HMD, which I failed. Um, <laughs> but I developed an interest in cameras at the time and it was probably an interest more like a lot of young people, boys especially, in the kit. So I had my SLR, my contacts, and then the RB67, which is medium format, which is a bigger negative. But I was taking some fairly dismal stuff. I was, I was well kitted out, but I was taking some rubbish. Sloping horizons and all the rest of it. Anyway, I then drifted into um, a job at a London hotel. And I would say that's where my education in terms of looking and being aware of life really started to develop. Because when you work in a hotel as a chamber person, you start seeing something different to a middle-class village in, in Oxfordshire. Um, uh, after that, I, I should have really done a photography course at this point, but I really wasn't very you know, thinking very fast. And I ended up teaching abroad, because what you do at that time, you can, you, talk, you, know, you can speak English, you can talk to people in your language and teach it. And then I came back and I had a, a meeting with a friend who I'd done my retakes with and he was using a 5.4 camera, which was uh, an MPP, a bit like a speed graphic or something like that, which produced a negative like this one here. And it just totally blew my mind and I looked at it and I thought, what the hell is that? And it was a, a total awakening. So all my pictures of puppies, horses, the sunsets and everything in colour, it just, just blew that away. Um, anyway, I then came back and I was still so middle class, I thought, well, I can't do photography as a career because it's not a proper job. So I ended up doing stonemasonry with the hope of becoming a sculptor because sculpture, and sculpture, as we all know, is an art form which is regarded by everybody highly. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so I then went uh, into building conservation, working on historic buildings, and then building, and then house husband. Because at that point I was then married, <laughs> and realising that I was married to somebody who earned money, and I certainly wasn't going to be earning much money. So, what I've tried to do with my pictures is, um, how do I do this? I don't know. Right. Right. I've tried to put things into some sort of order. Um, like I haven't got here. Right. Sorry, let's just excuse me. Um, <coughs> categories. So I have tried to categorise, which I think is probably a bit foolish because you'll soon see that <coughs> I don't think very clearly, and the idea of categorising a lot of this stuff is, is hopeless. But anyway, I've tried to do that. So the first seven I've, I've put into um, what I call texture and tone. So this is really based on what I saw in that first negative I saw of wet leaves. And it was nothing more than that, just wet leaves, and I thought, amazing, the tone. So here we have a fairly cliché subject, um, but I thought I'm going to take it, and I, I've never regretted taking that, but it is. It's white flowers, you get this sort of thing. 
And also, together with text and tone, we've got movement. So, so. Mm. same sort of thing. Can't do. It. it was fantastic, you know, when you go and buy your vegetables and things like that. You the subject matter all over the place. This is probably a little bit um, in the line of, I don't know if people know Minor White, a photographer of the 50s, I think. And he was very spiritual. He also talked about metaphor. So I was clearly looking for something here. And I think um, spiritual is possibly does bring in some of this. Yeah. So we went through these fairly quickly. These are seeds which are collected in Brazil. So any opportunity to find subject matter, acacia seeds. Um, so I'm trying to obviously express something about what I see around me. Um, and I think, yes, mixed meanings. I think these are also, people who know Edward Weston, who tried to be very, this is the next category which I've talked about as forms elevated. They try to be purist. I think it's very hard to be purist when you're taking a picture of something objectively. I think this has so many meanings. It works on so many levels. <coughs> so form, texture, sensuousness, it's all, it's all there. I'm going to <laughs> now lose track of exactly where I am on my, my categories. But again, it's, it's trees. And I'm, I'm pretty much a butterfly, so I'm hopping all over the place. I don't have any clear idea of where I'm going. It's very intuitive, it's very instinctual. So, yeah, so the virtues, other textures, tones, and a little bit of humour here and there. <laughs> Parsnips. Interestingly, my wife said to her, she thought this was quite a sad image. I don't see it as that, but I just see it as a study of mass and form. But uh, who, who knows really what we're thinking when we take these, these pictures. And, yeah, parallels again, you know, we see some <coughs> and shapes. So I think that's, the human eye is very good at doing that. It's trying to find patterns, it's trying to find connections and meanings. I don't know what my meanings are, but I find I see the connections maybe. Pat Choi. Again, like at Western, people often said to him, you make your, your subjects very sensual, and he would have got quite, I think, annoyed with some of this. He just said, No, I'm just trying to represent it as it is. But he obviously had a way. I mean, <coughs> Pepper num number 30, you probably know, it's a picture of Pepper, but it looks like a woman's back. It's got this wonderful feel to it. <coughs> And also, you're never at a loss of subject matter, are you? You know, you buy pears, they're beautiful and they're fresh. And then when they say decay, they decay in different ways and say different things. And again, possibly a bit of anthropomorphizing, there's a, a form in it. And for me, this is very much, it's a rabbit hole. I play, a lot of this is about play. And I suspect what I've done throughout, throughout my life is try to create uh, order out of chaos, and I think that's what a lot of photographers do. It's a very personal uh, endeavour where you're struggling to order your thoughts and the world around you, and this is a mechanism of doing it. And it's also, you just disappear into this and you are, as I say, down the rabbit hole and you can be there for, for hours and come out exhausted. That's if your family let you do it, of course. Which my family have been very good. So found objects. I think it is a distraction sometimes. I think uh, in terms of addiction, it's possibly stopped me from focusing on things. Maybe I should have concentrated more on whatever I was working at. But I didn't, so. So then we get on to shortly, um, there's compositions um, as well as found objects, as I say. The, Connections between this is this is doing my brother's house and this is the rubbish which is in the, the cellar and this for me works on lots of levels. It's uh, a life lived. It's discarded objects which at some point were bought new and probably really loved. Um, 
it's possibly a little bit sad, but it's the idea of elevating the ordinary, the banal, and I think that's our problem today, is we move over things, and we'll get onto this in, in talking about digital photography, we move over things so fast, and what my work allows me to do is just stop, slow down, and contemplate, and I think we need to do that with everything. I think it's a simple solution if we just slow down a little bit. This is, uh, I don't know if anybody knows Baker Street, around by the Butchers, uh, Selwood Road, and uh, George here has got the most amazing Virginia Creeper. This is more about opportunities now. Photography does allow you opportunities it, to meet people, talk to people, and, and just document life. And I took a picture of him in front of it, sitting in a chair, but then I took this picture because it has this mass, and I didn't realise I got him in the corner, just looking quite hopeless with a pair of shears. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that really says it all about life in many ways. Uh, what can you do? You can only do a little bit. Um, yeah, lifting up the ordinary um, poor old squash head help, which has still got life as well. So there's all sorts of paradoxes. And two shrews, which have died, having fallen down into a, a, a tarmac um, hollow in uh, Gloucestershire. So yeah, this is a very old picture, which is on a magazine which um, Will there was part of, called Furball, about 20 years ago. A fantastic little magazine, very quirky, very funny. Wish it could come back. So again, trying to put things into categories. Um, all this stuff was done at various points during my life. Uh, and this was the only thing that seemed to have any coherence was my photography. And of course, I had unwittingly absorbed our culture and our tradition of Western art, of um, Spanish still lives and the Dutch. Um, of course, I would say, well, it's, it's a photograph, it's not the same as a painting, so it's not valid. But, So I'm still in love with childcare. Uh, my wife is working, I'm just going after two kids. He's not my, my child. It's my friend's mother and her granddaughter. But it does give you the opportunity, it's a thing if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. So it allows you access to a world that a lot of us, you know, if you're working, don't have access to. And these three, three kids, well, they just broke in their arm. I don't think I was that influenced by Sally Man, but you kind of, there is an urge to do this. You are allowed briefly into another world, a world you've left behind. And sometimes, you know, you're co-conspirators, and other times you're an outsider, but it's, it's a unique opportunity and, and a fantastic thing to be able to record. It's uh, obviously <laughs> 10 years old and totally different. Max, so I want to take some pictures of lights, Craig. Can you come out here, please? I did one of Jeremy as well, so um, yeah, no planning going to. So yeah, nobody's paying me to do this. I'm just, just fluffing around. My son, mucking around. You know, let's take that picture. He's half aware of me. He would frequently strip off, cover himself in mud, and does not care about us taking a picture of him. He's oblivious. Later on, though, as they got older, it became more co-workers. So we would work at things like this, for example. Here, yeah, we're not quite sure who's looking at who. But, um, yeah, we, again, we're just trying to make something, and sometimes it works, and I think I love this. It's uh, obviously for personal reasons. And this is uh, our father, who art in heaven, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> he sometimes looks a little bit sinister, but he was, he was uh, about to go out to take service. I set up this weird background, he didn't bat on me. He just said, yeah, sure, sure, I've got five minutes, I'll sit here. He said, shall I smile? I said, no, 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 don't smile. So he sat there going, <laughs> nah, and I ended up with this picture, which is somewhat uh, bizarre. But, and opportunities. Um, going out with camera, you, you meet people. You know, especially with this, this camera here, it takes time to set up. People go, what are you doing? Is it an old camera? Sometimes it's a pain in the ass, but other times it's wonderful. And a guy came along and he, he looked at it, he looked at me and he said, he says, I, I walk this, this little alleyway, he says, I do it every day, morning and evening, and I often see this. And I think, isn't it amazing? And I said, he said, I'm so jealous of you, I, I think, to have the time to stop and appreciate it. And I thought, what a, what a beautiful connection to make. 
Um, okay, so really, that, that's, that's it really. Um, have I really got to come to the end of that? I think I've got something else to add, so if I can find it. I don't think there's any, any more pictures. No, no let's turn on to Joss. <laughs> so this is really where me and Joss um, come together. It's, it's very personal. But I struggle to know what purpose my stuff has. I, ha I don't have anybody saying, patting me on the head, saying, well done, you've done what I've asked you to do. I have no brief. Uh, that's a, a liberation, it's a pleasure, it's a freedom, but it's also quite onerous. Someone's telling you what to do, but I found that it's not quite that simple as Joss will tell you in a minute. Okay? Before you, before you uh, pass over, can I ask you a couple of questions? Sure. In the middle of that, you said something to the effect that it's photography, so it's not valid as art. Ooh. Is that right? Is that how you feel, really? I think it probably is how I felt, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How you felt, how you feel now? I don't know. I still don't know. I, it's um, like an addiction. It's, uh, I, I anguish over these things. And some people have told me to shut up and get on with it. <laughs> well, I think I can pitch in there. Because that's Do in please. a way that's really where we take over of having known each other a very short amount of time, but a rather intense kind of photographic amount of time. And we see in my pictures, they all, as photographers, we all start with the same kind of, is it worth anything, does it mean anything, am I any good? How do you validate your work? Is it by being paid for it, or is it by peer approval, or by having enough balls to say, I'm really happy with this. So when I met Martin, I was really uh, felt sort of my professional world had been really beautifully subverted by somebody who is making photographs because they love them and they don't need to serve a purpose beyond that. I've got a very strong sense that they will and they might need someone else to curate or to push or to recontextualize. And my, as we see in my work, my working world has had a very different pragmatic structured necessity to it whereby i then work to brief to a time to commission to delivery and have to distance yourself from the, often from the output of what people choose to do to it so it's transactional so meeting martin was like becoming 16 years old again Mm -hmm. And like that's why we love taking pictures. Yeah, that's why we do it. So I wanted to. But so before you do that, can I just pick up on one thing? <coughs> um, you see, when I look at your work, Martin, I see an acute eye, and I see a consistent style, and I look at the body of work, which is like wow. And, I, and I don't know anything about the making of it. <laughs> I'm not that clever, but I look at it, and yes, you can say. You see a little bit of minor white or something like that. But actually, I just see Martin Wade, to be honest. Despite the fact that the subject matter is all over. Yeah, because to me, I mean, we'll see what the audience thinks afterwards, but I see really strong consistency. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've got one more question and we'll move on. So when you're taking photographs, do you kind of take a thing? You, oh, I'm going to take that picture because it's in front of me. Or do you go looking for the thing? How does it work? Or, does it, or is it both? Both, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you just see something and you just grab it. With going by trout, not trout, um, some mackerel or something like that. And, and yeah, you know, it's not a slave because I've got to photograph these things there and then. Um, but other times I'm struggling. I struggle because if I don't have a brief, I've got to create a brief. And you're going to be wasting time. You'd waste the whole day just playing with bits and pieces and not um, taking anything. Or you take something and think, well, you just took that because you, you know. So yeah. It's, I can assure you, speaking on behalf of the audience, not one of those pictures is a waste of time. Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a fantastic I think this is also part of our conversation, because it's about how, do you, how can you appraise yourself? How can you value your work when the instinct is to undervalue and to undersell? Right. Everyone's modest and apprehensive of saying, I'm, I'm really good at this, and I've taken pictures, you know, the, the, the world and the peers and the market and, and the economy validates your work if it sells and then, then self proliferates but, the, but, the, but I think what's super interesting with serious talent and understanding and 
uh, aptitude, how there is still the conversation of, of what does it mean? And is, it, is it worth it? But I think I would say that any, any worthwhile, decent, creative, as a word, and I don't particularly like, but I don't really know what it means. If you're not reflective, if you don't question your work, Absolutely. and say it's a shit or not, <coughs> you're going to be probably producing rubbish. When you, okay, I've said that was one yeah. nice question, so here's another one. So when you've finished a picture, do you put it to one side, or do you study it and try to figure out how you've improved it? I mean, what's your um, response no, to I the picture? Do. No, I and this is why I really admire people who have ideas. I've got various friends who, who work on ideas, and they refine, and they, they, they're trying to say something. I, I you know, really don't. Well, it's remarkable, because I still see a hugely consistent set of pictures. Yeah. Anyway, do you want to move yeah. on, Jules? <coughs> so, a, a brief kind of my history to date was, uh, again, a, a teenager thinking, what on earth do you do? At a very so unremarkable school thinking, I've got to find something to do, but I can't just like come out of here with nothing. And then I met a wonderful art teacher, and he said, come to a photography club. I said, I can do that. It's slightly technical, it's busy, it's crafty, it uses gadgets. And what I was super interested in always was being nosy with people. <laughs> Not smart enough to be a journalist, but with a been a photographer, and I remember seeing a documentary on Don McCullum and Joseph Vidalka, and they were photographers, and they did that, that was their job. So they, that is genius. These guys do photography, and it never occurred to me that could be a job. So my early influence was of photojournalism, and I came out, and I went to art school and left after two years, went to another art school and only left after a year, and I was impatient, and I was busy, and wanted to come and do it. And I was a sort of pain in the neck, really, because I, I really wanted to photograph, exhibit, do books, do articles, work for National Geographic, work for the Sunday Times, and I was just a fidget and a pain in the neck. And I thought, the only way, going back to our, like our parents, I said to my dad, I really want to go and take these pictures, uh, but I'm never going to be a photographer. I'll go and teach English in Hong Kong, and while I'm there, I'll take pictures. And he went, oh, hang about, just back up on that. If you want to go to Hong Kong and be an English teacher, where's the photography going to do? He said, if you want to go to Hong Kong and be a photographer, then I'll help you out and off you go. So it was rather kind of like, rather than sort of go around the houses, just go for it. So I ended up in, in Hong Kong for three or four years and travelled extensively and worked for magazines and newspapers and, and the card supplements. And sort of started to find a kind of, uh, like a, when, when your pictures can represent the world you're photographing and yourself simultaneously. And you're thinking, that's the genius of photography amongst any of the other art forms, that it's a prism and it shows you both sides of the light at the same time. And and when I moved back to London, I was thinking, how on earth, in the early 90s, how on earth do you start working? I wanted to be a photojournalist, do editorial commissions. No one was getting commissioned. Everything was bathrooms, gardens, cooking. And the magazines were sort of dead in the water. And the only smart magazines that had any budget were the kind of fashion magazines, you know, Harper's or Vogue or Marie Claire, and I couldn't ever get seen them. And it then struck me that the other world that could be really interesting was the world of filmmaking. And within filmmaking, they use photography for the publicity, the marketing, the, not just the continuity, but for, for the, the marketing and promotion of the film. The very first film I was asked to do was a costume drama of Pride and Prejudice of Colin Firth walking out of a puddle covered in wet, you know, in a wet <laughs> t-shirt. Probably my most famous photograph, but I'm not going to show it tonight. And so I then targeted and sort of thought, okay, if you're going to work in, in film, try and get in touch with the people whose films you admire, people who, who work in film in the same sort of capacity that you would like to be as a photographer. And I had the absolute, total, blinding good fortune to hook up with a director called Ken Roach and work with him for the last 30 years. So these are photographs which are taken during the course of my career with Ken and how they get used and recontextualized from a shoot in the street, the pictures then get cut out and then get used and used in, in, you know, for, the, for the posters. So, as opposed to Martin, 
where the pictures, uh, I'm not speaking out of terms, the pictures struggle to find their life, you know, which will become a book in an exhibition ultimately. My pictures have a very immediate reusing and often get cut out, get, get put, you know, put with text. Photographs here, this is actually two photographs put together from the sort of sequential frames that then get put together because they wanted deep focus in both pictures. But they, working with the designers, they end up trying to keep the authentic sort of moment. And I'd say, if anything, I'm now sort of known within the filmmaking world as being a sort of a, a captured moment photographer rather than a studio, everything gets shot in pieces and then put together afterwards. So I'd always, again, try and find photographs which take you back to, you know, Joseph Cadelco climbing onto a tank, or Don McCullum working <coughs> in a kind of, in a, in a, some kind of energetic space, and thinking, you can, like Martin would say, you can photograph anything, and you can be anywhere, and if you're acute enough, and sharp, and have your wits about you, there's pictures everywhere. So I think that's been the real gift with working with a filmmaker like Ken Loach, is that He's, he's endlessly restless and asking you to, to perform at that level as well. So this is just some other... So how the pictures that get, get used from a shoot and get turned into the, to what we, end, what we end up consuming. Mm -hmm. This is a, a little grab moment that then gets turned into the poster. Mm -hmm. <coughs> It's like a, a Ralph Lauren commercial, mm -hmm. and it ended up as a book cover and a, and a film poster. So one of the conversations Martin and I keep going back to is that Martin gets very, I, I would say, uh, so almost envious that the pictures have a have a place to live. And I end up feeling, yeah, but they're, they're easy. It's easy to take a picture like this. It's a <laughs> wonderful person sitting in a little mud hut in Sligo in the rain. And it's, and it's no, 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 hold on. This ties back into early portraiture. It ties back into time. It's, there's a vernacular, there's an understanding, there's an education. It's not an accident. Like, yeah, but it's on a film. It doesn't, a film is like a second-hand experience. So what I've now thought really about photographing on a film set, that it's... It's a world of a constructed reality. However, like a novelist can often get closer to the, to the meat of the matter, filmmakers can often get much closer to the, to the meat of the issue, the subject. And as a photographer in that world, you have to not mind that you're, you're a second-hand author, almost. So, so I'm starting to feel now with enough sort of water flows that actually the pictures then do start to have a purpose. And it's, there's now enough of them to kind of feel that they have a time and a place. And that's before he was James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> that's before she's been over the cruise. <laughs> <laughs> that was while she was Tilda Swinton. <laughs> And after these, these shoots, you get given maybe two, sort of two to three minutes to photograph them. And she'd been photographed by four other people in a row, and everyone gets given their moment, and I was given you know, five minutes for the PR, sort of saying, actually, can you make it three? And so I found a background and thought, I know what, I'll shoot on tungsten film, it will make it really nice and cold. And then I said, can you look right into the lens, look right into the lens? And she went, oh, I haven't got time to point to where the lens is. I'm really, really short-sighted. So I just pointed, had a bit of gaffer tape about the lens, which is stared at it, and somehow it became, you know, that iconic picture that gets used everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> this was one of the only, um, and you often get asked, do you, do you ever meet actors that make you feel a bit kind of giddy? And it's very, very rare, apart from Rutger Hauer, who did, who uh, was in the most terrifying film I saw as a child called The Hitcher. And he photographed him. And he was terrifying. <laughs> So 
So these, I put these photographs in to, again to show the other sort of side of it. So my work is primarily on a set where you work quickly as a sort of reporter. And then you then take people aside and set up a background. And then these photographs get used for the artwork and for the, you know, for the, for the um, posters. Like that. So that was, that was a frame from that set up that then gets used for the, for the covers. And that was, going back to Martin, that was one of these jobs that on paper is the cheesiest thing on earth. And in reality, is the nicest job I've done in many years. <laughs> so again, alongside my commercial work, I also work for various other sort of, sort of organisations and trying to sort of take, take a little bit of what you do and help, you know, reconnect to being the life as a more of a sort of reporter. And then, just to finish off, one of the conversations about working on Ken's film, this is a film by I, Daniel Blake, was that quite often the film stills have a life outside of the film. And this was a film that came out in 2016 about this girl who ends up needing to use a food bank. The photograph is used probably about twice a week to represent the society where we still now need food banks more than anything. So the, the, the photograph has a second life and a third life and a fourth life. And probably in 10 years time it becomes iconic of that period of time. And hopefully you know, you'll look back and think, wasn't that a weird time when we needed food banks? And it was a, it was a found moment, a scene within the film, that the picture then gets a second life. And this, I put this in as, a, as an example just within the sort of PR and commercial world. I don't know if the people have seen the film I don't know, but it is not cheerful. And it's not a good news story. <coughs> However, what we decided, the writer Paul Laverty and I, who had come up with the poster concept, was that the film should make you feel so egregious and so you know, hostile that there has to become some kind of resistance and action and you know, um, response to people still needing food bags at this time in the 21st century. So we thought actually the photograph of Daniel Blake is a resistance photograph, not a, an acceptance photograph, and not a miserable guy who has a terrible life and it all goes wrong and he dies. So that then gets, ended up, it became a poster, which then had a second life, as the, it was the message of what we hoped the film would evoke in the audience. Mm. And this was a, um, an image that my friend Paul, the writer, he said, I've just got such a strong image of running down a fence with a stick, and I go, tak, 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 tak. So we found, a, you know, fence in Newcastle, and it became again like a, an image like a found, constructed reality that then somehow completely hit the mark. And this is a, a cheeky homage to Cartier Brasson. I'm not sure everyone knows the image. We thought it was rather a bit of a pun that he's jumping over a puddle in front of his garage. I put these in, this, this just shows the different territories, how, how the type of images they choose to use in the different markets. So this is working for ITV for their documentary de department. And then we're back to square one. Okay, just leave it on that one. So can I ask you a couple of questions? Please do. Um, you said taking these pictures was easy. I'm not sure anybody would believe that. Because it seems to me I'm not a movie maker, but when you're making a movie, you've got a fair amount of time to create mood. You know, you have the space, you're creating the narrative, the start of <clears throat> so um, You've got to take it in, in still. How do you do that? How do you capture the mood of a 90 minute movie in a still? Well, that's... That's the art, to, isn't it? Well, that, that is entirely the brief, and often the world of movie making is, is constructed about the moving image. Mm -hmm. So, and 
the last person to talk to about trying to do a poster is the director, because they think in sequences and we think in stills. Mm -hmm. And they think in a sequence from here and from here, and we need it from there. So, so almost the worst place to be on a movie set is next to the movie camera, because they're shooting in a sequence, and you need the, the most boring photograph to see is over the back of someone's head. And that's part of film language, the two shot over someone's head, over the shoulder. So it's, it's often that I'd say 80% of the skill is a personnel skill of trying to cajole people to wait after a take, to be ready before a take, to maybe take a look round after a take, or, or in a rehearsal and rearrange someone. Or, so you're there, but you're not there. You're trying to tell your story, not their story, the story of the film rather than the story. So there is a lot of frustrated pictures that get away. And you're the only character on the film set that they can carry on filming without you. So if you're not there for a day, they, it doesn't matter to them. Mm -hmm. the, the frustration can be that there's so many pictures that get away that you sort of suddenly give up and people aren't, often aren't helpful. I've been lucky enough to work on lots of films where people really value the role of photography. And, and see, and they're independent filmmakers and they need their films to be shown. I think mean, that's different with the <coughs> productions. But the, I would say the skills goes back to the, uh, back to the beginning. You have to be really quick, really precise, and, and it's about, that about moments again. And have high interpersonal kind of acuity. Well, that's, that's one of the things about the tour that intrigued me, because just don't think that well, but I'm getting to know you a bit better. You're almost working with a team, and you're working on your own. So you're creating your own aesthetic without knowing whether people like it or not, or what they think about it, or what you should do with it. You're working to a brief, but you've probably got in your head an aesthetic that you'd like to get out there, and maybe the team doesn't help with. Completely. So how, how do you reconcile that? How do you, you have obviously a strong sense of aesthetics, but how do you manage to get your aesthetic into this kind of team edited thing. How does that work? It, by a lot of uh, sort of personnel persistence. So say for example on a set, they'd say, oh, we're shooting this scene and we need to be off by lunch. And then you speak to the art director, to the first assistant, to the sound department, to the costume, to the makeup, to the wardrobe, to the, to the props guys, to the lighting technicians, to the camera team, and say, give us five minutes to try and you know, you get this picture. And then you, you lay the groundwork, you send memos, you kind of, you know, this, that, and the other, and then somebody will, then the actors walk away. Or, <laughs> or somebody turns the lights off, because they haven't told the jelly off to, right. to not turn the lights off. Right. So there's, and that then comes back, so it's, that's about building the relationships, which are nothing to do with the photography. Mm. And you can't get anywhere near it unless you've actually established all the relationships. Right. And there's very obstructive people and very helpful people. But it's, it's an in, and you're a lone ranger, there's no one else in your team at all. So uh, there is a big team to make it happen, but no one on my team. Unless you get into the studio, well then you have everyone on your team, and then all eyes are on you to make it happen. And I would say that is by far the easiest part of the gig, than actually being on set and being the kind of, you know, the, the slight kind of um, unwanted kind of, Interloper. Interloper. Yeah. They, yeah. they, they want it, but they don't want to facilitate yeah. it. So, so do you think of yourself as an artist? I, I'd say more as sort of like a, a, like a documentary kind of is that different? reporter. Is that different? Can you not be a documentary artist? I, I, think the, I think the art kind of possibly comes with a bit of what's the pictures have matured in a while. But when you're looking back on them, you think actually that, was, that so, becomes iconic. That becomes a point in time. Right. But in its, in its purpose, it's transactional and it's, uh, it's purposeful. So, so art is time dependent? Is that what you're saying? I, I think we can, it can inherit a bit of meaning over time. Interesting. What about the Tilda's swim shot? I mean, you knew what you were doing to try to take that picture. Did you have any sense of how people would receive it? No. no. So it was no. incomplete, let's try this. It was a half a roll, six frames, half a roll, and that's how we get something. And then... But wasn't that the artist working there? 
that wasn't that wasn't a documentary photographer. No, no documentary no. photographer. She was that kind of film. Yeah, that's the artist, right? Well, that's that's. I think again, maybe Martin can pick up on is that within your craft, you have a lot of things, a lot of tools to come yeah. at your disposal. <coughs> you know, there's, and, and photography has many tricks and many kind of sure. assets to it. Well, you're obviously both incredibly good craft people. That's obvious. But Martin is smiling when you're talking about this. So what, what what were you thinking when he was talking about the art scene? Just just watching him work, he is an artist in the way he deals with people. He constructs, he brings about something. It's a certain alchemy and he he really looks after people, he really respects them, he makes all those connections because there's lots of rivalries between the different, you know, the sound and the makeup and all the rest of it. And he he just makes it really I, I see him on I've not seen him do um, film stills, but I've seen him working with, with actors. And he just has this magic. They just love him. And the people who he works with really like him as well because he's not threatening, he's, he's, he's affirming, he, he builds them up. And that way, you then end up getting that special shot through doing all the groundwork. So it's probably a bit like setting up a, a constructed still life, mm -hmm. that, that is what you are constructing. Mm -hmm. And some people don't have it. So, yeah, I think uh, I've seen some, yeah, the way you work with them, it's fantastic. It's a magic. And they respond, they, they just come alive and they go, yeah, look at that. He just gets them to do things which I think, okay, they're actors, but they've got to want to go through that stuff. But I've seen one or two people who've been <laughs> really hard work, but you've still got the laughs. Still got it. Oh, yeah. So there's always a lot of talking to talk about collaboration and uh, even socially engaged, all that kind of stuff. <coughs> do you see your work as collaboration? Is that how you kind of articulate it? Or are you no, still I mean, trying to get your point of view across? No, yeah. I mean, well, this brings us on to another sort of, a more sort of, like an ethical sort of conversation. I don't see it's necessarily collaborative, but I think it's, it's, it's one voice, definitely, so which is not a collaboration. It's, it's your like, voice. It's your voice. Yeah. There's always the danger that you kind of, you can utilise and take advantage of your position and use people to kind of further your own, you know, your, your own messaging. Right. Especially if you're photographing a more, you know, a more sort of soci socially kind of unprivileged world. And uh, to square that up in filmmaking is even more problematic because a filmmaking is a clumsy beast and it, and it just drives into town and it uses people and spits them out. So I kind of think actually, my my relation to that is is before you leave home. It's like you know why am I doing this and what is the purpose and what am I seeking to achieve from it? And if and I think it's I think we talk about it a lot. I think if your intention is is honest and, and yeah. pure and ethical and uh, clumsy and you know, so, but if your intention is there, it comes across in the time. And it's how you preload your 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 purpose. And if you're if you're you know, there's plenty of photographers out there who are um, very interested in themselves and and being famous or being rich or successful or very accomplished or being highly acclaimed by their peers and you know I think you can tell. You can tell from the way someone walks, you can tell from the way they carry themselves, the, the way they kind of what their intention is. So and so I think photography is a very, very interesting, rather pure sort of prism that, that can show the subject and the object simultaneously and can really expose the sort of enemies and clothes. Would you, uh, would you advise a new photographer sort of starting out in their career to work with the idea of intention? In time. Yeah. Because not everybody would. I've had many debates where people say, well, you, you, you don't need the intention, you're just taking the picture. I don't mean that go out and photograph cracks in the pavement all day long and, and give it meaning. I mean, that could be, but it's about what is your, what are you interested in and why are you interested in it? Right, okay. And my, my, always have been um, deeply sort of compelled and like Martin's addicted by the human condition and the human connection. And, and there's nothing more exciting than making a friend or making a connection. And, 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 and making some statement about your, 
about, about the human condition, whether it's suffering or joy or love or bereavement, but somehow to photographically depict that is, is a process. But do you worry, though, that the stuff you're doing, say, can nudge, it's not your stuff because That's always been the kind of that's the that's the, the, the balance. It's, mm. You know, if if um, if life had had little different details, you would have done your own projects and done your own books and done your own exhibitions. And, uh, you know, my life was slightly curtailed with having to make money in the meantime. But but he it, it seems very much that he has found something who he knows is special because. You were the person who put in a lot of legwork, you help him choose how it's uh, different approaches, the way it's going to be shot, you would go out and meet people in the streets yeah. and then form those relationships and have fun and taking pictures of them. And they are just ordinary people. Yeah. And you're the one who's taking pictures. And without that, a lot of his stuff would be kind of half of what it is. So, no. that, that's how, that's what's fantastic about being well resourced. You know, so, I still get the feeling you, you feel that it's not really the well, it's second hand. Gig. Yeah, it's exactly. like second hand. Yeah, but I don't see that. Yeah. You, yeah. you have that in common. Neither of you completely believe in yeah. this side of what you're doing. Because he's, he's from the social, the social documentary, you want to say something, you want to, to yeah. depict something and say, look at this. Absolutely. We're going to break in a minute, but before yeah. we do, can I ask the same question to both of you and give you your answer to it? That question. What's your answer to it? You must have seen that coming, I was going to ask. I, I, just, I, I googled it, to, to be honest, I thought just, <laughs> just for fun, let's, let's see what happens. <clears throat> and um, that was such a bother, so I just gave up. I thought, it means whatever it means to you. you know, it means so what does it mean, to what does it mean to you then? It's your me, answer for you. It doesn't still mean anything, yeah, because without it, I would struggle to, to make any sense of stuff around me. I would struggle to express myself. And I know that it, 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 some things resonate. Some pictures I've taken, I go, geez, that's a bummer. They I really didn't work that one. And I'll say, I really like that photo. Oh, that's interesting. So you do take pictures you don't believe in, but other people go, oh, I love that picture. And vice versa, you go, that's my favorite picture. And they go, mm. you know. So you, you, you're trying to find out how you relate to other people, what resonates. It's, it's language. Okay. It's our language. I, I, I completely echo it. it. It has to still mean something because it's still utterly compelling. And you're still trying to find the, the bits of magic where you feel connected and feel alive. But and, and I think the, 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 the dilemma is that it's so prolific mm. that our ability to evaluate and to catch up with ourselves isn't at the same pace as our ability to produce the magic. Mm. It's like panning for gold and, uh, and the bits of gold are getting smaller and smaller. They're there, but people are just look, overlooking them. So I think you're just going to be... Right. That's good. So we're just going to first of all say thank you to these two guys for showing us their work. <laughs> like it or not, you're both artists and you both make a serious point in so many different ways, and that you have in common. Um, I think we should probably have a really quick break if you don't mind, because I'm sure people have got lots of questions. So if we can maybe do <coughs> 10 minutes. I'll be back in here at say 25 tonight, if that's okay. <coughs> Should be time for the bar. A bit of fresh air, we'll take it from that. Okay, so I was going to show some slides to prompt questions, but I don't think I'm going to do that. I think we're just going to ask the questions. Let's see how that goes. So does anybody have any questions for anybody up here or anywhere else for that matter? This, there's a, sorry, there's a microphone, so if you wouldn't mind using the microphone. Is that coming through yet? Um, I actually know the answer to this question, but I'm thinking anybody who didn't know the answer <laughs> would be wondering, Martin, the picture of, of the, uh, the pumpkin, you've got that massive heavy pumpkin, and then you have a fly scene on top of it. And this is really a question about methodology. Um, so how did you pick the moment? You know, that because it's, you know, it sounds like a very uh, uh, 
you know, slow process that you're doing. So the, your, your methodology, you haven't really gone into, into that at all. Not a planting question, by the way. It's just, I'm thinking, did anybody else? Yeah, well, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of play. And, and um, as you probably guess, it's a dead hoverfly. <laughs> So I have boxes and boxes of, of crap, um, bones and all sorts of, lots of insects which I've just collected. So yeah, I I don't know what 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 when do you think you've found the image you want? That's a good question, and I think it's in, it's intuitive. I I got I got conned into doing um, uh, a photo uh, a workshop at Duxport, which is run by a, a guy called Peter Goldfield. Who's there, you know, and um, he managed to get a 5'4 still life photographer to go on a workshop where it's photo documentary with, with Likers, you know, SMRs and stuff like that. I'm going, what the hell? But it was very good at, at learning because um, you take hundreds of pictures and you refine everything and you, you gradually realise you do you have an intuitive way of functioning. You do know what you're doing. You're just <coughs> I guess a large format because you're just taking one or two pictures. Um, I don't know. You just you just know the moment. So there is the the, the that special moment which you know, can't impress on anybody else has talked about. But this it's the same thing. You just know you've got the image. Is that what you meant? I just have visions of you with your tweezers or whatever. You know, just, yeah. just positioning it. You know, it's not it's not total control. You know, you're, yeah. You're just your collections of things which you. Yeah, it's just playing, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and sometimes you get a result, you go, yeah, but other times you think, well, it just looks really contrived. So, yeah, so you don't see, like any photographer, you don't see the dross, you don't see the photos. Yeah. I, I don't see contrivance as an end result of the work. Oh, well, that's good, okay, yeah, that's good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you can pay me later. Um, anybody else have questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Is that working? Um, is there any more art uh, in old photographs when you actually develop them yourself? And so what's the process of going from taking a photograph to developing it to coming, or more art with digital media? Gosh, um, basically why don't I use digital, do you mean? Is, is it, does it add anything by using analogue? Oh, yeah. For you, is the, the, art yeah, process. the process is important. Yeah, I like I like using the, the mechanical cameras. Um, I like having uh, this hard copy. Um, but I, I appreciate that there's a lot of really good stuff done with um, with digital. But it's interesting. I think he's he's, he's Garth Patrick, who's here, converted from doing five four to digital. But he's, he said it just opened up a can of worms because he then got to. Because obviously, when you get that raw negative, you don't get um, you don't really get a result. You get the information, and you've got to interpret that information. And I've seen that when Joss does his editing. It's going, geez, there's so much stuff you've got to do. Yeah, I, I want to jump in there because I, I shot on film for 15 years, and then as soon as it was viable, I've never ever shot another old film in my life. And commercially. That was a gift to me because A, I've then got my own lab at home all day long. In the, in the environments that I photograph in, it was very, very restrictive and the film stop was very slow. You know, you'd have to push the film stop two or three stops to get anything and then it's just a grainy mush. There wasn't tungsten balanced film at a certain speed. There was, so converting to digital was like an absolute game changer. Well, and also you knew we had the shots. I had the shots, but also I could then grade, I could adjust, I could interpret the files <laughs> exactly how I wanted them to be. Yeah, but it could be a million things, though, couldn't it? Well, that, uh, it could be, but the, but the beauty is you can make it, you, you still have to have the process, and you still have to think, I want this picture to look like this. How do you get it? I'm sure when, you, when you're in the studio or photographing, you think, I know exactly how this picture's going to look. I know my kind mind. Of, are, I feel I'm, I'm, I've deliberately constrained myself, so therefore I know it's going to come out like that because that's the way the film works. But you know the tonal range, you know the chemical behaviour, you know the, 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 the structure of the negative. Yeah, there are lots of people who spend a lot of time in the dark and using different developers and really playing with it. And, and yeah. people say, oh, I love the dark. I hate the dark. 
my, my, these pictures go straight onto a grade of paper that I don't do any messing around with. I don't dodge them, I don't burn them. But I can't do that, I can't get asked. It's bad enough, <laughs> it is, to be honest. You know, moving on. So the idea of spending all this time. <coughs> So, so you, I, so I do you always get it right in the camera? Is that what you're saying? Oh, that's great, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do. I use the zone system. I know I've got a meter that tells me what's going to be, you know, I can get my exposures right. I can extend right. the development a bit, reduce it. Right. Uh, and and uh, sure, you have problems because paper's going out of you know, production these days. And the same with the, 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 the film. But yeah, generally you get something. Some, sometimes people. Other people have printed them up, or I've printed them in different materials, and I go, well, that's just as valid. It works. Yeah. So, um, okay, so Josh, back on yours, on the same question. Yeah. So you moved from, digi uh, from film to digital. If you were going to do an exhibition <laughs> of your work, yeah. say, yeah. 30 year retrospective, yeah. do you think the aesthetic would be similar across that 30 years, or did the technology change your aesthetic? I'd say the technology uh, it was much more restricted photographing on a film set yeah. on film. Yeah. There was only two film stocks you could ever use that was fast enough to get you in here. And I've never been, no one's ever been able to explain to me how a 320 ASA tungsten motion picture stock can see in the dark mm. and has 14 stops of latitude, which everyone dreams of. And in that same situation, I would want to be shooting at 3,000 ASA, and I've got two stops of latitude, and you've got to force the film, and it turns into rubbish. So digital allows you to actually photograph in the places that you can never photograph. But would the basic aesthetic change to what, what you're trying I, to I, do, I your vision of photograph? I would say that I'm much closer to, to where I want to be okay. now. Okay. So I can get images that you could never get. And, and there are so many pictures that would get away, or, or by candlelight, or by moonlight, or by you know, around the corner of a stage or, or just a little leak of light is a picture. Yeah. That's Whereas right. you can't photograph that on the hoof with a light going wide open and that's 6,000 ASA or something. I don't think I'm going to throw my M6 away. Now you can. <laughs> now you can. So, so, so nothing is, even on iPhone, you can get those photographs now. Yeah, you can. So, so it has allowed, but the technology allows you to do it, but you then have to still tether yourself back to what is it you're trying to say and, and what is it and why is it. Recurrent thing. Are there any more questions? One over there and one over here. So at the back first. The back first. Oh, sorry. <laughs> isn't isn't there a slight fear though with all shooting digital now, which I shoot mostly of, they're all on your hard drives, etc. We're gonna die, technology's gonna change, none of these photographs are gonna be seen. You know, they're on the hard drives. All of us here have probably got images on the hard drive. None of us are printing them off with Martin's work. The negatives are going to be available for the next hundred years. With most of the rest of us, what's the feeling on the way di digital is going? That's what makes the difference. Is that's one thing I did pick up when I looked up this title. I mean, did thing to do. But anyway, what's, what makes the difference is people don't print stuff up. They don't present it. Where's it then? Yeah. Uh, what do you think about that? I think it's, um, photographs live really well in books mm. and in a way there's a bit of a resurgence in sort of yeah. you know, independent book publishing, yeah. Hox and Mini Press or even people making their own books like Blur or kind of, yeah. you know, they, they, and, they, and photographs live well and rest well in books. It's and that's, that's now affordable. Like we can do that for ourselves. Yeah. We can make 10 copies and give them to people. We'll make a dummy copy and we'll take it to a publisher. We could never do that 15 years ago. Yeah. So yeah. that has sort of democratised where a picture lives. But it's, it takes discipline, it takes time, it, it takes effort. It's interesting. I'm quite interested myself in Japanese photography. And um, the idea of the photo book is totally embedded in being a photographer in, in Japan. It's like that's where the work goes first. It doesn't go on the wall, it, it doesn't go in there, it goes in the book. Yeah. And uh, I agree with you. In fact, one of the interesting pieces of feedback we've had on, on Photo Froom is we've been doing pictures <coughs> on a very large scale, which people don't always see, um, even the photographers. Um, and that's been quite a good thing. There's another question down here. Um, I just wanted to 
to ask a question about um, the black and white versus colour, really, that, that um, you know, one of the things that makes Martin's photographs very really consistent with the style is obviously the film you shoot on and the way you, but do you ever see the world in colour or do you see it? And I know yeah. there are lots of colours in, 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 within black and white, but also looking at, at Joss's photos, you know, what makes you think of Daniel Craig in black and white and, and Tilda Swanson in colour? I think the um, at, at when those photographs were taken, it, it was much more a stylistic choice. Now, now it can mean anything. So again, you have to then come back to like, are you thinking in black and white, looking in black and white, or is it a click of a switch and it's going to be anything? So Daniel Craig was photographed on you know in black and white intentionally, and Tilda, the, the photograph of Tilda was all about her eyes. So that was had to be a sort of pale, high key colour photograph. That they were they were intentional kind of decisions beforehand. Whereas it's very tempting to kind of authenticate a photograph by making it black and white. Yeah, I suppose that's what that's what black and white is natural more arty. I, I think it has a, it has a kind of a, like a, a photographic sort of vernacular which says I am now doing photography. Yeah. Doesn't it doesn't that go back to what uh, one of you said at the beginning about um, time and photography? So photography was built was built with black and white and we now look at these wonderful photographs of the past yeah. which almost all were in black and white and therefore to emulate the wonders of the past we have to shoot black and white today. Isn't that part I of think the whole it's thing? Also, it's about a photographic sort of, a, sort of signature and grammar which says serious photography is black and white. Yeah. yeah. It's like, that's, it abstracts it, so it dis takes away the distractions, it that isolates it. Exactly. It, it takes away the distractions, and it means yeah. you can focus, for me, on form and texture and things like that. Yeah. And uh, it gets a bit too busy for me. But I do take, I take colour work, but I take it on um, my camera uh, or, or you know, on a phone or something like that. But I do imagine. No, showing some of that one day, but it, it's, it's more obviously seductive sometimes, and I think to take the colour out of it is, gets down to more of the nitty gritty maybe. Um, I do love colour, yeah, but it's also, let's face it, if you're working in film, you could never get the, the colours you wanted, it was more expensive, um, you could, it, it never reproduced the same way, even now with the phones, the Samsungs and things, it's hyper real, you, you, you've got to tweak it to get uh, the, the proper interpretation that you want. So, uh, for me, it's simple. That's what it comes down to. Okay. Any more questions? Martin. Just to bring this discussion back to the original question, does photography still mean anything? Um, this, seeing the work of you two and hearing you speak sort of brought it back to me that if we wanted to say, does photography still mean anything? I think we could break it down into two types of photography, which you both practice. But in both cases, your photography has empathy, be it for a person or an object. We relate to what we're seeing in the picture. And I think photography that matters has empathy, and everything else is just Microsoft wallpaper, or it's, you know, it's just a sunset or a dandelion, or or a kitten, but you could take a picture of a kitten in an empathetic way, but most of it is not. It's just, a, oh, here's my cat, some kind of photography. So I think, just to bring it back to that, the, the basic question of does photography still mean anything? I think it does if it has empathy. Um, so it's more of a statement, but, you know, maybe, maybe I think it's more a, I think it's a question as well. I mean, yeah. does it? Does it, does, it, does it have empathy? Is that well, what you're well, trying to do? That's, that, that never expires. To <coughs> that's us together as human beings wanting to connect to each other. So any way you can, you can sort of um, represent that or kind of, you know, discuss that still is what sets us apart. Well, just to put Martin on the spot, I mean, you kind of set your stall out as being a photographer taking photographs for yourself. And you set your stall out as you know this not collaboration but working along with other people mm. as part of the magic. So back to <coughs> photography for yourself. Does it have empathy? Uh, well, um, uh, yeah, yes, I think 
hopefully it does. I'm trying to respect the object, I guess, and I'm photographing all the people. Um, I'm trying to not necessarily show it a good light, but it's an honest light. But it's, it's also subjective, isn't it? I mean, it's, um, yeah, I mean, as I say, I searched up this title, it came up with, um, there's a, a sort of, you know, the One Times magazine? That was one of the things that popped up, and uh, I looked at it, and images just made me despair. Uh, what, what kind of images? Ballet dancers, some of being photographed, and some sunsets, and all, and all sorts of things, which it's just totally not me. I would say it's not honest photography, but I was looking at the comments. And the person who wrote the article, and they they have feeling in it. It means something to them. And I thought, well, that's it. It doesn't matter what I think. It means a lot to these people and the other people, you know, have seen it. So therefore, I can't judge. None of us can judge. So I would personally say I'd like to have an honest, empathic person <coughs> other people who may not see that. I, can I pick up a word you use, which is respect? Hmm. Because I see that in your photographs all the time. You're very much respecting the situation and the person you're photographing. And if I hear the story right, right from the beginning of photography, and you said you respect the object, is respect a better word than anything? I, I, I would say that's going back to what I said earlier. That's that's the intention. You know, my and, and also as a when you're photographing people in all sorts of situations, that in a way is your license to be there. If you're there just to make a bunch of money by selling it to National Geographic, then, then right. you're going to be found out. You're going to, people will read that from you. And I've been photographed for the last eight weeks up in, in, in the County Durham and spent a lot of time with people in very dire straits who were very welcoming. And we did this big photo essay which is embedded within the film which is made about the experience of this mining village, which is now sort of fairly derelict. Mm -hmm. The people were welcoming to be photographed in all sorts of states. I'd like to think, because we were, you know... Respectful. Respectful, and had time, and we're not just sort of going harvesting images for our own benefit. Mm -hmm. And there was a... There was a like a, an alliance between us. It's invisible, isn't it? There's something it is, but totally intangible. Yeah. You see, I think I'm, uh, the picture of yours that I want to talk about, if there's time, yeah, is, so is, is, is the hedgehog. Because the hedgehog is, is my, one of my favourite pictures. Because it's also deeply witty. It's deeply sort of macabre and sort of mournful. And it's for, for a five by four plate photograph, it's really tense. Yeah. It's like it's speeding, yeah. and it, but it's like it's, it's what photography does. It's about time, it's about freezing time, it's mm -hmm. about sort of decay. So it's almost like a, it's almost like a time lapse of yeah of death. Yeah, and it's, then it's got some. I don't know if we can can we jump to it somehow. I can find it while you're talking. Photograph, because it's top to bottom. It feels like it's like a timeline, a time lapse of a, this animal decaying. So that's about life transitioning into death. The scream is so tense, like you can hear it sort of scream out. And then the rush of like a wind in its sort of in its projected teeth. Yeah. Projected teeth. Yeah. And you think that, that nothing else can do that. A painting can't do that. A poem can't do that. A cinema can't do that. Illustration can't do that. That's an interesting point. And painters yeah. can't there are things that paintings can't do. You know? yeah. So it's absolutely and for that to be a still moment, probably like a five minute exposure or something, mm. is really remarkable. Yeah, it's really tense. It's really <coughs> tense. It's an absolute found moment. But the moment is maybe five minutes. Yeah. And that's really sensational. Because usually a moment is like 2 and 50 of a second. Yeah, it's called cool. cool. a, a cool. core, like the, a moment of composition and tension. Whereas that's what I, I, when I said you have an eye for seeing things, yeah. that, that's exactly what happens. You find something and take a photograph. Yeah, yeah, much to annoyance again with my family quite often. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other questions from one down here? Um, yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot I could say, but I'm, <laughs> I'm only going to say 
a, a couple of things. I, I'm really so happy to have heard your voices this evening. Just getting back to the, the question that you posed about you know, is there a future for photography? Um, I just wanted to go back to the beginning of photography to how photography became the new painting, if you like, and when it was born in the 1840s, and how it evolved via pictorialism into what we have today. And what I feel, as maybe you guys can comment on this, is how voices like yours and others we could mention are drowned out by the one trillion pictures that are taken every year and how we're going to, um, you know, sort of leave our mark, if you like, on the world. I mean, I, I just actually, Martin, I'm just, this personal note, just looking at your pictures, there's one I really want to have from you. <laughs> I really, really want to have from you. It's not the hedgehog, by the way. Um, I really, really want to uh, thank you so much for your explanations of your your vision and your your voices because um, I think that's what photographers have. Is the, the net result of their background, whatever that is, results in their voice, and your voices are completely um, coherent to me. So um, I don't know really what, what question I'm. I think, I think the question is, how do you, how does the work live in the yeah. future against the sea where everything else is going yeah. on, exactly. if I paraphrase yeah. it? That's so, what, and that's a, well, to be yeah. honest, that's a really good way for us to try to work towards the end of this. Yeah. So, so which is, what is it, how does I, it work? I, I it? think it's highly problematic, because I, I, I sort of touched on it earlier, that the um, ability to appraise, sort of digest, appraise, absorb photographs has not kept anywhere at pace with the ability to produce them. And, and also the platform that we view pictures on now is all the same. So if it was a, a newspaper or a magazine, they, they would get laid out. This is the important one, this is the less important one. This is the story, let me take you through the kind of narrative of, of, how, of how I lead you. Now everything's you know, on a two by three of the screen and, and a war zone has the same importance as a, as a vegetable, as a kind of bathroom, as a kind of sunset. It's, it's, and it's very hard to discern and to, to, to elicit the meaning when you're also in control of the time it's shown. So in one minute it's beautifully democratic that everyone can photograph and publish and it's reached across the world instantly. But how about our, our ability to understand and evaluate those images haven't kept pace? So we, so we now, when I teach occasionally, people photograph and look at it, photograph, look at it, photograph, look at it, photograph, look at it, rather than know what they want to create. Back to your intention. Absolutely. So, yeah. so it's, it's almost more important to go back and look at the paintings and to look at the, you know, look at the landscape. Don't look at the photograph of the landscape. You know, yeah, don't be an influencer on Instagram. So, what, what yeah, I don't know much I can add, add, to, add to that. Really, I mean, we could say we just need to. I mean, book publishing it does seem to be very popular at the moment. People do seem to like books, and I do think it's a brilliant <coughs> vehicle for, for images. Um, are we going to stop people from filling the the, the, the vacuum <coughs> spaces with, with looking through images? I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't think so. I think that's that's that, that is the new reality. That is the new kind of. But I still think good pictures are going to be taken. Yeah, um, there always be people who will take good, good pictures. Just like how, but how do they float to the surface? How do they get noticed in the kind of mass stream of yeah, yeah. competition? Well, I think your point about them actually being seen properly in books or in exhibitions or dare I say at festivals and being discussed properly, I think that's a big issue. What's the language that we use to discuss a photograph? But, but we're, we're into kind of a, 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 another level. First, we've, we've, we've put the bounds around what we're looking at. We've, we've, a bit like with a cat, we've turned its head and said, look at this. This is worth looking at. Yeah. Something like this. You know, it's, a, it's just a dead hedgehog. But if you, if you put a boundary around it and make people look at it, and they go, oh, and people go, oh, I really like that. And think, yeah, it's dead, but you like it. That's interesting. But now we're having to do that with people's attention. Like, kind of, 
shake it to mm -hmm. books and say, just switch off a bit, don't look at that. So, yeah, it is getting more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, okay. yes. I don't know how it impacts on society. I, I do worry. It's still to be announced. <laughs> Sorry? I think the impact is to be announced. We don't yet, we don't yet know. Yeah. We're not, we're not digital natives yet. No, really. That's an interesting point. Are we digital natives? I, I actually think we are digital natives and we've actually forgotten the animal. We've actually forgotten what it looks like to really look at something because we're just flicking through everything. We should be asking people who are somewhat younger than us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there are any, any less questions, otherwise, we are on, on our slightly past our I mean, that is a good point. There are no, a few people here who are you know, a couple of decades, three, four, five, five decades younger. Who, um, do they think photography's got any point? I know some people are studying it, but. Um, can I tell you a quick story about my take on the meaning of photography? This is not about being younger than myself, because I'm not, I'm sure. Uh, I took my photographs along to an RPS, World Photographic Society, preview day where they review your photographs. And the guy from the, the, guy from the RPS, uh, which of course, as I'm sure you'll know, is the arbiter of taste, said, mine were absolutely terrible. I should learn to buy a decent camera and learn how to take photographs. Um, but before you feel too sorry for me, there were a couple of guys, a couple of goths at the back of the room who said afterwards very quietly to me that they thought that mine were the best. And I'm not saying that because it was a minority opinion. Everyone else liked the photographs that the gentleman here was talking about, which are very sharp, being sharp with photographs, travel photography, kittens and stuff. And I just wondered really who is the arbiter of what photographs, of the meaning of photographs, do we rely on on people like the RPS and the glossy magazines, or do we make that judgment ourselves? I, I think that's probably another talk. Um, <laughs> the only comment I'll make on that is that, um, and this is my comment on you guys just for a minute, I, in any photograph there's always been three people, there's always been a photographer, a subject, and an audience, that's always been the case right from the beginning of photography. Now we've got a few more people involved. <clears throat> we have uh, editors, we have curators, we have people that are doing the brief uh, for a movie, and so on and so forth. So it's got more complicated. Um, I think you can't avoid that, you can't ignore it. I comment on the RPS, I happen to be a fellow of the RPS, but I do know what you mean. I would simply say that there's enough space in this world for all kinds of different approaches to photography. And if that's what turns you on, cool. And if it's not, then fine. Um, I think people do what they really want to do. And I think that's one of the beauties and joys of photography, that everybody can actually do it. They don't need to listen to a particular person or organization telling them what to do. Now, we're kind of past our allotted date time, but I know everybody's interested, so I'm going to ask you guys, please, if you'd like to give a two or three minute summary on this subject. And I don't mean like, like a prepared speech, I mean having had the conversation, I know you've spoken a lot about these issues, the two of you, for something the audience. Back on this question, does photography mean anything? What, I mean, does it for you, right? Really? Yes? No? Well, personally, yes, and uh, other people still, you know, people are here, and People are still looking at images all the time. Yeah. So yeah, 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 yeah. Things, yeah. Uh, absolutely. And I think it's still utterly compelling. And to make an image that somehow can transcend its own moment and make connections, or a, a composition that somehow has, has a meaning, or a, a point in time that has lived beyond its own moment, is really quite precious. Uh, no, I was going to say there's a slight worry that we are totally in a visual world now. Films. Stories told through films and images and, and, and the like, and do kind of wide. Does that mean the end of books? Because people don't have the time to actually sit and uh, read something which has got possibly multiple meanings depending on you know, how you, you read it. I don't know. Are we worried about that as well? You, you, you mean not to worry about Marty. <laughs> <laughs> then you get into you know the, the famous iconic image that something that really sticks in the memory and people want to sort of savour that forever. 
I would argue that's actually something a photograph can do that a movie can't always do. Yeah. It can provide that moment. Whereas in a, in a movie, you're just kind of flashing past these things. Yeah. And that's one of the powers of good photography, I think. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, you've got all those phrases about the picture. You know, is it worth a thousand words? I think really, but, you know, with mine, they become like diaries. And I look at it and I'm back in that place, I'm back in that, that feeling and everything. So, yes, it, for me, it's a, a thousand word diary entry. Uh, and hopefully, it's what people bring to it. If they look at something and it means something to them, if it reminds them of something, it prompts something, it's significant. Yeah, so it's my word. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're finished, and I'd like you to give a big round of applause, please. And this is also, I mean, there is another day or two of exhibitions, but this is also effectively at the end of uh, the Festival of Photo Froom. As I said, um, we're going to come back, hopefully at least as good, because frankly topping that will be quite hard. And I think that was just a brilliant way to finish the festival, so thank you very much.